No, that's okay. I, okay. I think I know who I am. This is Will Rice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm Will Rice. I guess you just heard that. We are thrilled to be here. We really are for a number of reasons. But uh, one of them is uh, good to see friends. And another is it's nice and warm down here, but that really is down the list. It, it's on the list, I suppose, but it's down the list. And we are thrilled to be with you today. Let me introduce my wife, if I may. This is my wife, Sina. I'll just, you don't have to stand, but... The lady I'm sitting next to, you may have guessed, is my wife. Um, and then the guy next to her is our son, Weston. We have two others that are in college. And we are um, glad to be with you today. I'm from Bill Rice Ranch in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. How many of you have been to the Bill Rice Ranch? Anyone here been to the... Wow, okay, wow, quite a few. Okay, well, there's a picture of the entrance over there. And we live inside that gate. Everything's inside that gate. But, uh, uh, a lot going on even right now. And we thank God for, we love the prices and we love this church. That really is true. Uh, by the way, my, my church, Cumberland Hills Baptist Church, uh, is very thankful for you all. And loves the work that you are doing here. And so, hello from Cumberland Hills Baptist Church. Those are some friends of yours and from Bill Rice Ranch that are definitely friends of yours as well. Um, I, you've heard this story probably, but almost 70 years ago, God used my grandparents to start the Bill Rice Ranch uh, because of a burden they had to reach deaf people for the Lord Jesus. My aunt is deaf, and when they were just a young couple, still in Bible college actually, they had moved from everything they knew and loved, Texas, to Chicago. Uh, my grandmother hated cold weather in Chicago until the day she died at 101 years of age. If you're from Chicago, it's a great place. But if you're from Texas, it's about as opposite from her home as you could get. But they were there because they felt called to prepare for the ministry, the ministry of evangelism, to which God had called my grandfather. While they were there, uh, their baby daughter, Betty, became ill with spinal meningitis and was not expected to live. God spared her life, but she came out on the other side of that deaf and completely deaf she couldn't hear, she couldn't speak. Well, back in those days, this would have been the late 30s, there was virtually nothing that was being done for the deaf medically. Uh, socially, there was nothing, none of, none of things that you may know of now. And uh, most importantly, there was no one anywhere preaching the gospel to deaf in a language they understood. And so my grandparents began to look all over Chicago for a church, any church, that would preach the gospel to deaf people and found there were none. Um, one day they were driving down the road and my grandfather, Bill Rice, was complaining. He said, there are millions of deaf in this country and nobody's doing anything to reach them. And my grandmother, who, as I said, passed away three years ago at 101 years of age, she said, don't you know who's going to work with the deaf? He said, no, I don't. She said, well, I do. And Bill Rice, my granddad, tall daddy is what we call him, well, if you know, I wish you'd tell me. She said, you are, and I'm going to help you. And my grandfather said, Kathy, Princess, good night. We don't have any money. I don't know anything about deaf people. I don't. All the things that he, he did not have or know. And she said, when you preach to other people, you always tell them that what you have is enough to do what God wants you to do. And so my grandfather used to say, preach is the worst thing in the world is when your wife preaches your own sermon back to you. But that's what it took to get shake them awake. In 1950, they were in a little town called Murfreesboro. It's not little now, it was then. For a two-week revival crusade, they built an auditorium largely just for that crusade. And uh, they bought the original 900 acres of 1,300 acres. It became Bill Rice Ranch as a place where deaf kids could come free of charge. They come free of charge to this day, both in Tennessee and in Arizona and also in the Philippines where we run camps. And then, uh, so they invite deaf from all over the state to come free of charge. They've been coming free of charge ever since. A few years later, we began weeks for hearing young people. Now we have old people, young people, deaf people, hearing people that come to the ranch. The ranch is a, a revival ministry and camp is one of the methods we use to do the work of an evangelist. So as far as the deaf young people, um, I just talked to uh, Tyler Thornton uh, about four days ago, texted him actually three days ago. He and his wife run the deaf outreach of Bill Rice Ranch. Rebecca 
is herself deaf and was saved at the Bill Rice Ranch as a deaf camper uh, about, boy, 20 years ago. I mean, I, I remember it quite well, but all of a sudden those things are becoming longer and longer ago. <laughs> so that's just, I think you probably know, that's just a taste of who we are, what we're doing, and uh, it really is good to be here. I have not preached probably for the longest time I can remember. <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, and so it is really, really good to be with you all today. It's an honor to be with you. And Pastor Price, thank you for the privilege. You look forward to it. Joshua chapter 1. Did I even tell you that? Usually that's the first thing out of my mouth. So Joshua chapter 1 is our text. And Pastor Price, what time do you go to in Sunday school? Quarter till. Quarter till. That's plenty of time. Okay. Joshua chapter 1. How many of you know the man who seems to take the center stage in the book of Joshua? Any wild guesses? What what man? <laughs> hey! Oh, wow! Joshua. Brilliant people! Good. And you remember what God had promised Joshua and the nation that he was leading? Israel. Derek, okay, promised land, Israel. Israel is the people he led, and they were going to take possession of the land of Canaan. And so the way that came down, the way that happened was with the first uh, the first place they went was a, a, a city-state called Jericho. And what would follow in subsequent chapters, the story as it unfolds, is that they would take Jericho without firing a shot. Israel did not take the land. It was not the Canaanites to give. God gave Israel that land. It belongs and belonged to to him. So Israel didn't take it. Canaan didn't give it. God gave it. And God is going to tell Joshua in chapter 1. Well, actually, Joshua is going to tell his people how they're going to prep for this battle. The battle of, of Jericho. Again, I say battle was hardly a battle because they took the walls without firing a shot. This is how it goes down. Joshua chapter 1 verse 1. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim Two men to spy secretly. Now let me just stop. What? Two. Chapter 2. I'm sorry. Joshua chapter 2. Is that what I told you? No, I didn't so tell you anything. One. I've been out of practice like I told you. So Joshua <laughs> chapter 2. <laughs> I practice all the time. Yeah. Exactly yeah. Right. yeah. Pastor practice all the time. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so he was going to send two men to spy secretly. Now let me ask you a question. Hasn't every spy who's ever been sent anywhere, anytime been secret? <laughs> so isn't spy secretly a little bit of a redundancy here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so did the Bible put this for no reason? I mean, spy secretly, do you think this is uh, an intentional redundancy that is an, 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 an intentional saying the same thing twice in different ways? Do you think God did this on purpose? Yes or no? Yes. 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 So the question you have to ask yourself is, secretly to whom? The Canaanites. Okay, the Canaanites. Now, oddly enough, the Canaanites knew there were spies in the land. Okay, so who did not know that Joshua was sending two spies into the land of Canaan? His own people. Now, why would they not have known? Because he didn't tell them. I know I'm asking a lot of questions, but see, we're, we're discovering things, right? Things we thought we knew. Maybe things we didn't know. Okay, because he didn't, why did Joshua not tell? The Bible does not tell us. It doesn't give commentary. But you don't have to be a genius to know why. Go back to Numbers chapter 13. We won't do that now. But years before, there had been two spies sent into the land, mm -hmm. and ten more. God said, conquer Canaan. They sent spies to dis discover, not if they should obey God, but how. But as it turns out, ten of them came back saying, we can obey God, and, and two discovered, hey, we can. And Joshua was one of those two spies. Mm -hmm. So before in their history, when they tried to send spies to accommodate their doing what God told them to do, they didn't even do it. Right? So we're, in that sense, were the spies a help or a hindrance years before? Oh. They were a hindrance. Yeah, they, two were a help, ten were a hindrance. So Joshua, remembering that, we would assume, is sending two more spies into the same land. And he sent them secretly. And he didn't tell the people of Israel. The reason he didn't, didn't tell them is because he didn't want them to what? Start a war. He didn't want them to know and start an internal war. Okay, so in short, Joshua knew his history and had, had learned from it. You said what I'm saying so far. Okay, he sent two spies secretly saying, verse 1, go view the land, even Jericho. 
And they went and came unto an harlot's house named Rahab the harlot and lodged there. Now we're not going to tell this story, but uh, some have, have surmised that it would be a wise place for two spies to be because it would not be an unusual thing for, for a strange men to be in such a house, correct? Yeah. So whatever the case, they were in this house, she hid them. In short, she spared their lives from the king and the people that were looking for these spies. Now, once you go down to verse 9, and this tells you a little bit about her. And she said to the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. I know Simon already said this. God gave them the land, and that your terror has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because, here's the cause, because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water. We've heard all that God has done. You can look up this way. What you have here is a remarkable story. Now, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever made a dumb mistake? Yes. <laughs> All of us have made mistakes, but if you're like me, you've made dumb ones. Mistakes you didn't have to make. I mean, sometimes we can, you know, make a mistake, but it sounds noble, it almost sounds virtuous that you even made the mistake, but at least you're trying. I'm not talking about that kind of mistake. I'm talking about a dumb mistake. It's not noble if anyone finds out the mistake you've made. How many of you here have made a dumb mistake? No. Okay, probably half of us anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right? Let me ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hand, but you think about this. How many of you have made the same dumb mistake twice? <laughs> it's kind of like the guy that's ironing a shirt, you know, and a guy calls on the phone, and he answers the iron. And the guy says, oh, man, that looks, what, what did you do to your ear? Oh, I, I was ironing my shirt. Someone called. I answered the iron. It was dumb, but I did it. I said, oh, that's what, what happened to your other ear? He said, the idiot called back. So, you ever made the same mistake twice? Yeah, we all have. We've all made the same dumb mistake. Now, let me just tell you about two kinds of people in this room and in this story. Okay? A wise person is a student of the past and not a slave of the past. Amen. That's good. So everybody here is one of two things. I mean, this, there may be a continuum, there may, there may be a scale, but every person here is one of two people. You either are a slave of your past or you're a student of the past. I want to ask you, which are you? Now, let's think about Joshua and Rahab. Can you think of two people that were more different than Joshua and Rahab? Probably not. One was a Jew, one was a Gentile. One was a general, one is called in the Bible a harlot. One was conquering Canaan, one was in Canaan. One served God, Jehovah, one was subject to idolatry. Can you think of two people more different, more different <laughs> than, than Joshua and Rahab? And yet, the New Testament commentary on them, like, for instance, go to uh, Hebrews 11. We won't now. We might at the end if we have time. But you go to Hebrews 11, both of them are found in Hebrews 11 in the Hall of Faith. So here's what I'm here to tell you. Joshua and Caleb, if you had seen them on that day, Joshua would have been wearing a blue suit with a red tie. Right? Because that's me. <laughs> All right? Uh, Rahab would have been outside the door and, and she'd be embarrassed to come in. But it was all said and done. Regardless of what you see or what you think, they were more alike than they were different. And the reason they were more alike than they were different is because of the relationship they chose to have with God. They both lived by faith, which we'll get to, and not by sight. And both of them were people that learned from their mistakes. You know, someone has said, and this is true, what you learn from experience, from mistakes, depends on the philosophy you bring to it. Now, what does that mean? Okay, it sounds high flute, it's very simple. Here's a guy, he, uh, he's robbing houses. He, 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 he burglarizes houses. And he tries to burglarize houses at 10 o'clock at night. And he gets caught. And he learns from his mistake. Now, is that good or bad? Depends on what he learned. It depends on the philosophy, the way of thinking that he brings to his mistake. So what most guys do is they think, hey, I'm going to burglarize at 10 in the morning, which is when most of this happens, you know, because everyone has gone to work. I learned this from a police officer. It's counterintuitive unless you know, you probably know, right? So if he starts burglarizing homes at 10 o'clock, is that good or bad? It's bad. Did he learn anything? Yes. Did he help him? No. Because of the way of thinking he brought to the mistake he made. 
uh, the same guy has said, getting really educated when you don't change your relationship to God just makes more clever devils of us all. Now, God does not want you to be a more clever devil. God's not going to bankroll your education to make you a genius at doing the wrong things. God wants you, God wants me, not to be a slave to our past. He wants us to be a student of our past. He wants us to make progress in the right direction. Now, let me, let me ask you which are you, and then let me tell you how you can know, all right? You look at students and slaves, both illustrated by Joshua and Rahab. And you can see what emerges is some very clear differences between people who are a slave to their past and people who are students of their past. Let me give you at least four, okay? I say at least four. I'll give you at least one, and if time's up, that's it. If we have time, we'll do four. How's that, all right? Number one, slave and, slave and servant. Which I just, in my notes, I just have two columns, all right? Here's the difference between the two. A slave of his past lives down to his own low expectations. A student lives up to God's promise and commandments. So let's take them by, by turn. What does a slave to the past do? He lives down to his own low expectations. Well, my family is always, well, this is what the church expects of me. Um, well, this is what I've done in my past. Um, we always, um, you never, those are 100% those are statements that don't leave room for change now, do they? So I may be talking to someone this morning, and in your mind, the story you're playing out in your mind, your script, if you will, is, in my family, we have always blank. Now, I'm not trying to be uncomfortable. That's not smart. That's not smart because it, it neglects the fact that you are an individual, that you have a choice, and that you are responsible. Amen. That's good. I was just talking to uh, Derek back here. I don't mean to embarrass Derek, but Derek was talking about a, a family he has, and there's like uh, four people with the same name. Well, I'm the same way. I'm the fourth because we couldn't think of a better name, and now I've got a son named the fifth. And we're just, we're not very creative. We've gone with the same name for like 150 years, right? It was, you got a good name, why change it? Why blow a good thing? <laughs> so, then William, you can do anything with William. William, Bill, Willie, Liam, whatever. So, uh, someone says, well, in my family, we have always, whatever, good, bad, or indifferent. Here's the question. Have you thought about which is good and bad? Have you seen what God thinks about what you're doing? And are you willing to change? Or are you allowing your family to impose on you, foist on you, an identity that does not belong to the name? Do you understand what I'm saying? Most of us have like a 20-year memory. We think everything's the way it's always been. Look, there was a time before America, there will be a time after America, and most of us are, are slaves to our little province of time and space. It's not very smart, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs, even a child is what? Known. Known by his what? His doings, not his intentions, not his thoughts, what he does. Now, what he does comes from what he thinks, but I'm here to tell you, you have a choice. And if you are living down to your own low expectations, you're a slave, you're not a student. Um, I, I found people, sometimes I, you live down to your own reputation. Maybe you have a reputation for something that is less than noble. <laughs> but somehow you, you, you turn that into a virtue. Or you think, well, hey, you know, at least I, yeah, maybe, I, maybe I'm a clod, but at least I'm not a hypocrite. So you don't have the common decency to lie about it. <laughs> that was irony, in case you were wondering. I don't think you should lie. My point is that, you know, sometimes we have a bad reputation, we feel compelled, and think about how dumb this is. And sometimes just knowing how bad something is, is taking it from the back of your brain and then looking at it right here. Oh, you know what? That's not very smart, is it? There's something that we all do, but we don't think about it's not very smart to be trapped by your own reputation. Well, this is my reputation, so I always sleep in church, so if I don't sleep in church, people will wonder what's wrong with me. <laughs> or maybe people greet you by reminding you of how bad you are. Hang them and be a student. Now, what about a student? A student lives up to God's promise and commandments. Let me give you an example. Chapter 1, verse 2. God says, Moses, my <coughs> servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even unto the children of Israel. God had promised Israel land. Moses was dead. Joshua was new, but God's promise was undiminished and had not changed. Chapter 2, verse 9, uh, 9 and 10. We already saw this, so we won't read it again. But, but uh, Rahab says, I know the Lord's given you this land. I know what he's done for you up to this point. Um, look at verse 24. 24, the last verse of chapter 2. 
And they, the spies, said to Joshua, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. God's giving them land. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 7. Let me, forgive me for hurrying here, but I don't want to waste any time. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel. Why? That they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. Was and will. So, are you a student, are you a slave, or are you a student? A slave lives down to his expectations. A, a, a student lives up to God's, God's promise and expectations. Number two, how does a, how does a slave feel about his past? Miserable. Miserable. Doesn't like it, and yet he keeps doing it. Why? Because, because what? Because he thinks he has no choice. He thinks he has no choice. And I, I'm sure this was a good answer, too. But you're exactly right. A slave, in other words, is trapped by his past. Now, that's not a, that's not a, 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 you know, a fait accompli. It's not something that has to be. But that's the way a lot of us live. Well, it, I'm trapped. What does a student do? A student grows wiser from his experience. Can you see that in Joshua and Rahab? Most certainly. Joshua said, look, we sent two spies, 12 spies. Ten gave a bad report. I ain't doing that again. We want to be prepared, but I'm not telling anyone in Israel, I'm not telling anyone in Canaan either, but it's going to be secret spying, <laughs> meaning no one's going to know the spies until the king of Jericho finds out, which didn't work out too good either way. But interesting, they, they, he didn't feel trapped. What about, uh, what about Rahab? She's a harlot. She lives on the wall. She lives in Jericho. Was she unwilling to change when the truth mandated that? No. She said, I've served this God. I know that your God has given you this land. I know that. I'm going to hide you. So she grew wiser. Uh, Sir Winston Churchill said, in essence, you know, we're, we, are but, uh, we are but a culmination of all that has come before us. That's, that's a paraphrase. But we are... We're but a culmination of all that's come before us. And there's no doubt that you can look. Have you ever looked at pictures of you when you were like five years old? Probably you don't do it frequently. So if you don't do it frequently and you've done it recently, you probably, oh, that looks like my grandchild, right? That looks like my, my kid. What's happening? History is, in a small way, repeating itself. Now, that may be the natural way of things, but it's not the smart way of things. Um, Churchill also said, history will be kind to me, for I intend to write it. In other words, history is written by the victors, and he meant that quite literally. He wrote volumes of history. The point is, who are you going to let write your story? Your reputation? Your family? Your, 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 your weakest inclinations? Or God's truth? Um, it's kind of like a, a trailer in Florida. There have been times, I won't rehash them, but in Florida in particular, where I've got a big fifth wheel and wet sand, and I'm trying to leave on a Saturday to go to the next church, and I can't because I'm trapped. I'm stuck. I remember a church will be in South Carolina next month. I did that years ago. I had to have a literally a track a bulldozer, I think it was, pull us out of the, the churchyard, and we had big ruts. I'm not exaggerating, this deep, all, all the way up to the axle, just to get out of there. Uh, sometimes we feel like we're in trick, you know, quicksand. Like the past is our quicksand. We feel trapped. Okay, but neither Joshua nor Rahab felt that way. They both grew wiser. Look, for instance, at chapter uh, uh, chapter uh, two, verse eighteen. Um, the spies are speaking to Rahab, and they say, "Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line, the line with which she left them out of the wall, of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst." let us down by and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee um, is, is experience the best teacher yes. no. not always if you're talking about a child whether a child should play in the road or not I don't I don't want to rely on his you know experience to teach that kid that cars are dangerous do I <laughs> But having said that, if you're still alive and you've made a mistake, what makes you a slave to repeat that? Who says you have to do that again? Do you have the moxie 
to see what the Bible says, to be honest about what you know the Bible says, and then to change your behavior accordingly. Student or slave? A slave feels trapped, the student grows wiser. Number three, a slave of the past never changes. A slave of the past never changes. Now, he may change his hairstyle every month uh, to make up for that lack of real change. You understand what I'm saying? You know, superficial things. Uh, but a student of the past is constantly adapting to uh, maintain a steady course. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Look at uh, verse 11 of chapter, uh, of chapter 2. Um, Rahab, she's called the harlot here, speaks to the spies and she says, And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Verse 12, now therefore I pray you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, and ye will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token. Look at verse 21. And she said, according unto thy your words, so be it. Um, and she sent them away, the spies, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line uh, in the window. So she, what did she do? She grew wiser. Uh, the falling walls were not destruction. They were a rescue for Rahab. So a slave never changes. You know, my granddad who started the Bill Rice Ranch, he used to watch sometimes a 15-year-old camper who was just totally incorrigible. And, and by the way, we love such kids. <laughs> We've dealt with thousands of them, and we like them. We love them. We don't always like them, we love them. <laughs> and he'd say, I can write his story. What do you mean? Did he mean he was a fortune teller? He meant you don't have to be. History repeats itself. You don't have to be a genius. Look, we have more history from which to learn than we've ever had in human history. I mean, if you think about that, it's a silly thing to say, but it's so unobvious, that, but it should be obvious. We have more history from which to learn than we've ever had before. If you can't see what works, and what doesn't work, and how the Bible does work, and change your course, you're not using the mind God gave you. So, uh, a, a slave never changes. Um, again, forgive me, third time, I'll, I promise I'll stop. Winston Churchill famously changed his party more than once as a MP, as a member of parliament in Great Britain. And uh, there are a number of reasons for that, which I won't go into, but... Bottom line is, he, he once said, I'd rather be right than consistent. Now, you can argue whether he was or not. My point is, do you realize if you're going to remain unchanged as to the things that matter in this life, there are a number of things that must change every day. Why? Precisely so that you'll be unchanging as to the things that matter. Is anybody here an airplane pilot by chance? Okay, what? Really? Okay, I don't know anything about flying much, but you've got... You've got uh, uh, can, you know, surfaces that control the plane, right? Ailerons and, and flaps and so on, right? When you're in a plane, unlike a car, you don't just turn and you turn. In a plane, you, you turn and you come back. And you're constantly pitch and yaw, left, right, forward, back. You're constantly maintaining, unless you're in a 737, you put on auto. If it's a little plane, all things being equal, you're probably maintaining control. You're constantly reshifting the plane back into a vector, which means your hands are not still. They are constantly moving in order that the plane remain unmoving. Does that make sense to you? In other words, the things that matter need never change, and that means everything else must change. Um, you know, it's interesting, all the people that are so opinionated all the time. Um, I, I can think of several groups. Uh, uh, doctors. And this is not bad, this is good, but doctors are very opinionated, and they have different opinions. It's confusing. Um, uh, firearms enthusiasts yeah, are very opinionated. That's the wrong gun! And they know it. Um, people that like cars, yeah. you know, and I say uh, Tesla. You've got an opinion about it, one way or the other, right? Very opinionated. Now, look, I'm not suggesting that you go through life willy-nilly. What I'm saying is you've got to be able to be right and not instead of opinionated. I'd rather be right, Churchill said, than consistent. Now, it's not saying that being inconsistent is a virtue. What he's saying is, I'd rather be 
right if that means changing the consistently wrong. So a slave that never changes. On the other hand, a student of the past changes constantly in order to maintain a steady course. It doesn't change his convictions, the core things that make him who he or she is, but you change everything else. For, for instance, look. <clears throat> the friends you have now, the friends you had 30 years ago. Now I hope you've been a friend to all those people nonstop. But as to the friends that influence your life, if you're going to maintain a, a, a constant course, people notice the superficial things like you go to the same churches, you have the same friends, whatever. What God notices is, where are you on the things that matter? What, what I've said and what you're doing. So if a friend changes, their level of influence with me must change as well. Are you with me? That's right. Either my conviction has to change or my friend has to change. And what people see is your friends, you know, your title, where you go. What people don't think about is, what does God say and where am I in that? So all I'm saying is don't be, I'm not urging you to be inconsistent. What I'm saying is pay attention, admit when you're wrong. Saul said, um, when caught by disobeying God, yea, I, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. No, he not. You know, I hope we're all learning all the time. I hope I'm learning all the time. But one of the things I have learned is it is impossible to help a person who cannot be helped without hurting their feelings. In other words, if someone's feelings are constantly hurt, you're walking on eggshells around them, you can't ever help them. Now, I know that puts me in the driver's seat, like I'm the person that has all the help. I don't mean it that way. I just mean a person who can never be helped without having their feelings hurt cannot be helped. They're beyond hope. Um, so, slave or student. One more and we're done, all right? Um, and that is this. Uh, a slave feels alone, and uh, a student acknowledges God in their, in their past and in their future. What did the spies of Joshua's day say when they came back? What's that? The Lord gave us the land. That's what Joshua said. That's what Caleb said. And that's why they remember they are, are in Joshua chapter 2. What did the other ten spies say when they came back and gave the report to Moses? Oh, they're so big we can't go through walls. They're all we these things. Like we feel like little, yeah, like little, we're like little bugs. They're going to squash us. Do you think Joshua, years and years before, had any conception at all that the walls of Jericho would fall? <laughs> By the way, they, they didn't. They didn't fall uh, inward as you'd expect if if an army were breaching the walls of a city state. Archaeology shows they did not fall in. They did not fall uh, inward. They crumbled or maybe fell outward. So, could could Joshua have conceived then that God would give them victory this way? No. You've read the story. You know the story. Joshua hadn't read the story. So uh, they said, we can't. They're giants. They're walls. Who did they leave out of that, that calculation? God. God. So they were on their own. When you're a slave to your past, you are on your own. I can't. I have. I'll keep doing this. God, no one can help me as if there's not a God. Is there not a God? I just finished reading Daniel. Oh, it was on the screen. Just finished reading Daniel a week or so ago. And I love it. Nebuchadnezzar says, Tell me what my dream is, tell me what it means, or you're all dead. And Daniel repeated the wise, the, the wise man by saying, no one can tell you your dream, but there is a God. The king didn't give the wise man more time. You know why? They didn't want more time so they could interpret the dream. They wanted more time so they knew know what the dream was. Daniel asked for more time, but he didn't ask what the dream was. God gave him the dream, and God gave him the meaning. So my point is... Um, Daniel said, but there is a God. You're not alone unless you choose to be. What does a student of the past do? Chapter 3, verse 7, as we've already seen, said, uh, this day, God says to Joshua, will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. Um, a slave says, oh, I've got to make this happen. You made your New Year's resolutions a month ago, you're already done. Now, I'm not burdened about that, nor do I plan to give help today about diet. But I do about your integrity, and I do about your, your character, I do about what, where you stand with God. So, I have to make this happen. 
what is a what is a student does? A student sees ahead, and he sees how God will provide. It's called providence. God's provide us. God God is God's providing things now for things we don't even see. That's why providence both provides and also looks ahead in ways you can't. That's why faith is not blind. Sight is. You can't see a mile from here. You can't see a day ahead. God knows eternity past from eternity future. Who do you think sees more? See, God knows everything. I know God. I don't know everything, but I know God. If I know God, I don't need to know everything. You understand what I'm saying? So let me give you a, 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 a story and we're done, all right? A student acknowledges the worst of his present reality. He confronts the facts as they are, and he maintains hope that he will prevail in the end with God's grace. It's called the Stockdale Paradox. Stockdale was, I think, the highest ranking service member taken in the Hanoi Hilton during the Vietnam War. Whether that's exactly, I think that's true, but in either case, he was, he was a prisoner of war. Years later, as he was teaching at Stanford, uh, a guy whose name I forget right now, but he wrote about this, said uh, he was interviewing the general who had been in the, the prisoner of war camp. And uh, he seemed to be a man of no small amount of optimism. And so imagine his surprise at the paradox when, when interviewing this general, he said to the general, what, what men didn't make it out of Hanoi? He said, oh, that's easy, the optimists. Well, that was didn't seem to match given the fact that he himself was an optimist, the, the author thought, Jim Collins, Jim thought. He said, no, the optimist was the guy that said, we'll be out by Christmas, and Christmas would come and go, and we'd still be here. <laughs> and, and then he'd say, well, we'll be out by Valentine's, and Valentine's would come and go, and we'd still be here. We'll be out by Easter, and Easter would come and go, and we'd still be here. And died of a broken heart. You know, God told his people in Babylon, uh, basically prosper in the land where you are right now. Pray for their good. Yeah. In other words, grow, grow where you're planted. He said... So the Stockdale par paradox is this. The Stockdale par paradox is two truths that don't seem to be in agreement, but they are, is to acknowledge the worst of your present reality, number one, confront the facts as they are, don't put your head in the sand, and number three, maintain the hope that, that you'll prevail in the end. Now, because I'm a believer, I can add something to that. Is, and that is God's providence. I'm not saying, hey, everything's great if it's not. But I acknowledge what needs to change. I know that God's in control, and I seek his help for the past. Now, let me take you to Hebrews, and we're done, all right? You've been very patient, and I, I appreciate it. Hebrews chapter 11, and I just want you to see how God speaks of Joshua and Rahab. General Joshua, Rahab, Rahab the harlot. Is that the way God sees them? Does God see Joshua as this general, and Rahab as a harlot? How does God see them? People see what you accomplish. God knows who you trust. Uh, Hebrews 11.30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Who led that group? Joshua. What did he do? Learn from his past. Where did that result in? Trusting God. Verse 31. By faith, the heart of Rahab in that city, apparent enemy, but not because she trusted God by faith, perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. I don't care what money you make, what your past is, what your name is, what your title is, the way you see yourself. I know the way God sees you. And what God cares about this morning is not where you've been. What He cares about this morning is where you're headed and who you're going to trust. Father, thank you for the Bible and thank you for our friends here. And I pray that today would honor you and help us. And I pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.